All right. Well, it is my pleasure now to introduce our panel on uh, college math savings programs. Our moderator is Ray Bashura. He's a senior advisor at the St. Louis Fed's Institute for Economic Equity, where he focuses on wealth in inequities. He's also a senior fellow at the Aspen Institute. Uh, before joining the Fed in 2011, he was vice president of New America, a DC think tank, uh, where you heard uh, Wesley works, um, where he led congressional efforts around match savings and savings account at birth for struggling Americans. Uh, he'll be joined by Kate Hoffman, the CEO and founder of Earn to Learn. Uh, Kate got the idea for Earn to Learn in 2010 with the dream of using match savings accounts to empower individuals to become financially competent and build lifelong assets such as education and home ownership. Prior to that, Kate worked in the financial services sector. Eileen Klein is the former state treasurer of Arizona. She served as chief of staff to the governor during the Great Recession and was responsible for the state's financial and economic recovery plan. She is president emerita of the Arizona Board of Regents and a former member of the State Board of Education. Lee Lambert has been the chancellor of Pima Community College since 2013. He has long held that community colleges such as Pima are instruments of social justice and are uniquely positioned to address systemic educational and economic inequity. Throughout his community college career, he has been an innovator in connecting industry and community colleges to revitalize communities through educational opportunity. And finally, Glenn Hammer became the president and CEO of the Texas Association of Business in March 2021. Prior to that, he had held the same position with the Arizona Chamber of Commerce and Industry for 14 years. Uh, Glenn has previously held positions as Chief of Staff to Arizona Congressman Matt Salmon, Executive Director of the Arizona Republican Party, Legislative Assistant to Senator John Kyle, and Ex Executive Director of the Solar Energy Industries Association. Uh, I'm really excited for this panel, so uh, I'll just move ahead and Ray, turn it over to you. Great. Uh, thank you so much, PJ, for the, not just today, but for the fabulous series that you've organized. It's uh, impressive as always. You've got a great team there. And uh, uh, I'm, uh, as, as PJ mentioned, I'm Ray Boshar. I'm with the Institute, the newly launched Institute for Economic Equity at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. Uh, for many years, I was working just really on wealth inequality, but we zoomed out now to look at economic equity a little bit more broadly. So uh, why am I on this panel? Because Kate asked me to be, and then PJ followed up. Um, I've had the good fortune of knowing Kate uh, from the early years of uh, Earn to Learn. And probably most relevant for our conversation here today is before I joined New America, I worked at what was then CFED, what is now Prosperity Now, on a match savings program that uh, was enshrined in the law called the Assets for Independence Act. And uh, what it did is it created uh, federally matched uh, individual development accounts for low income struggling families who were saving for a, a first home, um, a small business and for uh, higher education. So that was authorized in, in uh, 1998, uh, tens of thousands of people throughout the country now have these match savings programs. Now, so uh, further into the program, uh, Kate had the brilliant idea to sort of seize this Assets for Independence Act uh, framework and say, maybe we can think about uh, connecting uh, high school kids who uh, may not be college bound, but could be with a little bit of assistance and you know, leverage the AFIA resources to provide um, matching dollars for these kids who were saving, saving for their future. And so she, um, you know, there was a there, there was a, a non-federal matching requirement, which uh, Kate did a brilliant job of leveraging, uh, and to what later became, uh, of course, uh, Earn to Learn. And so um, she engaged me. She engaged partners nationwide and of uh, you know community colleges, and thought leaders, policymakers. And um, she's really done great work in bringing this discussion to where it is today, where folks are talking about it as, a, as an alternative to financing higher education. So uh, we're gonna look more closely at that model today. Uh, why is it compelling uh, for financing higher ed? Uh, you know, what, are, what are folks doing to contribute to its success and what, what can others do to scale it up? Um, just to provide a, just a little bit more context uh, for the discussion here, I thought I would, just uh, mention a couple of things. Uh, first is that, um, you know, there's, we've done research uh, at the 
St. Louis Fed um, around education and around wealth and around income and you know who's benefiting and who's not. And uh, we were looking at college returns. We had a whole symposium on college returns and we found that the income returns on those with a college degree have been fairly steady across both uh, uh, generations and races. So in other words, uh, if you compare the amount of income that you have compared to somebody who's uh, similarly situated but did not does not have a college degree, you know, you, you come out better off. You have a higher income than you would have had you not gone to college. Um, however, when we looked at the wealth returns, you know, how much more wealth do you have by going to college versus not, we found that the wealth returns were declining across both generations and races, especially among blacks. And then we tried to figure out, well, what's going on? Why, why are income returns holding up, but why, but why are not wealth returns holding up? And it turns out that student loans um, are really one of the big, one of the big reasons uh, why you know, the wealth returns have been diminishing. Um, and many of you are familiar with uh, other research by Pew and by Willie Elliott showing that student loans displace other forms of building wealth disproportionately. And so it made sense that, that these student loans would eat into these wealth returns. But we also found uh, in our research that those who start but don't complete college and still have their loans, um, we're also seeing you know, uh, pr pretty precipitous declines in their wealth as well. And that's because, um, among other reasons, that Oren Cast and others have argued that there aren't just there aren't enough alternatives uh, to a to a four year college degree, and we needed a stronger pipeline to uh, our nation's community colleges. So what I what I'm trying to do here with this context is make you know two really important points. I think that by Earn to Learn focusing on reducing student loans and creating a much stronger pipeline to community colleges really is in line with the latest and best research that we've done and I think others have done. So, you know, um, you know, th I think this program is right on mark uh, for what, you know, what families need in order to have better, you know, better college success. Um, so the, the, just the last piece of context that I want to provide is um, a little bit about what we've learned about savings and match savings uh, through the Assets for Independent Dependence Act and other match savings programs around the country. And here, I think, again, you're going to find that, you know, Earn to Learn is right on track. So, um, as I mentioned, um, you know, IDAs have been around for a long time. They've been tested experimentally. They've been evaluated thoroughly. And I think the reason we have a match savings program is really to achieve two, two things. One is equity and one is incentive. Okay, you match somebody's savings account to give them a greater opportunity to accumulate more, uh, you know, so they can purchase some kind of an asset. And the match is basically the, the equivalent of a federal tax break that somebody with a higher income might get. So not having access to those tax breaks, the match sort of becomes a uh, a way of achieving some level of equity in terms of incentives, in terms of, uh, you know, for, for accumulating wealth. And then the incentive part is a little more, a little easier if you, if you, um, you know, if you match somebody's savings, are they more likely to save than they would and maybe save more? So um, the match actually did promote both equity um, and savings. However, the most, the most fascinating finding coming out of the IDA experiments was that um, something mattered even more than the um, than the than the, the than the match, and that was access to a structured savings mechanism. Um, and we even found uh, in research that the very lowest income people, people at 50% of the poverty line or below, saved a greater percentage of their income than those who were relatively better off poor families. In other words, it was access to the structure you know, that actually had a strong, the strongest effect on savings, you know, than anything else. And so here again, I think uh, what, what Earn to Learn has done right is it's structured a savings opportunity. Um, and, and I think that's one of the reasons that it, that it has, uh, one, of, one of the reasons that it has succeeded. So um, with that brief introduction, uh, I'm pleased to turn it over to um, our panel. I do have a couple of questions I'm just going to throw out there that maybe we can get to towards, uh, you know, uh, after the presentations and into the discussion. And the first has to do with uh, the 529 platform 
and uh, you know, just wondering what the pros and cons of using that platform is. Um, I've been using it uh, in uh, my efforts related to setting up 529 savings accounts at birth. And I was wondering what your experience with that has been. And then just my second question revolves around um, what we've learned in the child savings accounts field, which is that when kids have a savings account in their name, they develop what's called a college bound identity. And you know, they're more likely to think of themselves as going to college, which creates incentives and behavior changes in the short term. And I'm just wondering if that's something you're seeing um, in Earn to Learn as well. So um, with that, please keep those questions in mind. I hope we can get to them and we look forward to the panel questions as well. Uh, the order today is uh, Kate will kick us off and talk a little bit more about, uh, you know, Earn to Learn and its, its successes. Then we'll move to Eileen, then to Lee, and then to Glenn. So with that, Kate, the stage is all yours. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm really excited to be here and be part of uh, this amazing uh, series of sessions on innovation in financing higher education. I uh, would really like to thank uh, both PJ and Ray for setting the stage for us to share with you all about Earn to Learn. Uh, and I definitely appreciate that context that you provided, Ray, relative to uh, the significance of match savings and what it could mean for supporting low income students and families. Uh, and not only in the state of Arizona, but at scale across multiple states. Um, my background, as PJ shared, is I worked in the financial services sector uh, prior to shifting into nonprofit. Uh, and really early on in my research in the nonprofit uh, world, I came across match savings uh, and the concept of individual development accounts. And it really resonated with me because of my background. And I would also say what also really spoke to me was the aspect of financial capability training being a, a core component of individual development accounts or match savings. Ultimately, uh, I had the opportunity to take this concept uh, to the three state universities in Arizona uh, back in 2011, 2012 timeframe. Um, and really spearheaded these conversations with the financial aid offices with Arizona State University, Northern Arizona University, and University of Arizona. And uh, I am so grateful that all three of those schools agreed to apply to Assets for Independence and effectively launch uh, Earn to Learn in Arizona. And uh, the program got up and off the ground in January of 2013, and it was definitely uh, a building the plane while you're flying it scenario, right? We had to figure out uh, who we were partnering with to house the accounts on behalf of the students. Uh, we certainly had to figure out the flow of funds with financial aid and how this would work. Uh, and then ultimately, we also had to go out and recruit students to participate in the program. The uh, first couple of years, uh, there was a lot of learning that was happening here in Arizona, uh, but ultimately the decision was made that this program wasn't going to simply be about access and recruitment, that we really wanted to support the students all the way through to graduation. So it became a renewable opportunity whereby the students could do this their first year on campus, their second year on campus, their third year on campus, et cetera supporting them all the way through to graduation with the intent of those students being able to enter the workforce with little to no student loan debt. The other piece that I would share with you guys about the target population is not only was this program positioned to support students coming up out of high school, but we were also looking to support students of all ages. And in fact, even to this day, uh, we have students enrolled in the program who are in their early 60s and, and all of those ages in between. So I think one of the things that I'm really excited about with a program like Earn to Learn is that we are positioned to be able to support adult learners, uh, especially in light of the fact that uh, the issue or the need to look at the opportunity to reskill or upskill certainly existed before this pandemic, but has been amplified as a result of this pandemic. So 
we're really excited about the ability to support adult learners with a program like Earn to Learn, which leads me to my next point uh, before I talk about the actual program design, and that is that uh, since we launched in Arizona, we've also now successfully expanded the program to community college students. So we're working with Pima Community College and Maricopa Community College District so that Earn to Learn is not only supporting students on the four-year pathway, we're also able to support students on the two-year pathway. And most recently, uh, we've expanded to support vocational training and CTE. And I think there's a lot to be said about supporting multiple pathways and supporting those students through to completion with little to no student loan debt. Uh, so to talk a little bit about the way that the program works, we're serving the Pell eligible target population uh, with this model. So as long as students qualify for at least $1 of Pell Grant aid, uh, they are able to participate in Earn to Learn. Uh, the very first step is that uh, they have to complete personal finance training as a prerequisite to even apply. So it's approximately three hours of personal finance training, uh, which we are providing on on an online platform for students. Uh, once they've completed that step, they meet with our success coaching team uh, who make sure that they are indeed income eligible and that's when they establish the account to start to systematically save towards a savings goal of $500 per academic year as long as they're successfully completing the program requirements and they're on track to attend one of our partner institutions of higher education, they receive $8 for every dollar they save in that account. So it's an 800% return on that college savings account. And again, it is renewable. So for students who participate as many as four years, uh, they would save a total of 2000 over that four year period to earn $16,000 in additional grant aid, and that's money that they don't have to borrow and they don't have to pay back. Uh, the other really key point that I would like to share is that Earn to Learn is really positioned to address unmet need. So certainly if students have a need to support tuition, uh, Earn to Learn can help uh, to support tuition if they qualify for Pell and there's still a gap relative to tuition. But ultimately what I'm very excited about is Earn to Learn can also be positioned to support uh, books, fees, housing, meal plans, parking, transportation, and honestly, I feel like a lot of borrowing is happening in some of those other costs that make up the overall cost of attendance. Um, in Arizona, we have uh, successfully served over 2,000 students with this model, and I would like to share with you guys the success metrics are uh, really impressive uh, for the students and families that we've served. Uh, the first year retention rate for the program is hovering around 90%. And we've recently pulled reports from the National Student Clearinghouse to uh, be able to provide projections on the potential completion rate or graduation rate. And for the traditional students that we're serving, it appears that we're on track to see completion rates approaching 80%. And for that non-traditional student population, so again, think adult learners uh, or students who didn't come directly into post-secondary right out of high school, um, we're on track to see completion rates potentially over 85%. And I really think if Earn to Learn is positioned as a supplement to Pell, effectively as a, an additional tool in the tool chest to support uh, college affordability, that is... Um, an important concept for, for the presentation today in terms of you know, affordability ranking number one uh, when PJ started off with that poll. Um, ultimately, uh, the average student loan debt coming out of our university system here in Arizona is around 23, 24,000, which is lower than the national average. Uh, but the students in Earn to Learn are actually graduating with the vast, vast majority between zero and $10,000 in student loan debt. So it's dramatically lower uh, than their peers potentially. And, and that's a really big deal when you're getting ready to enter the workforce that you don't have that potential albatross of student loan debt uh, really weighing you down. And I think 
you know, the, the comments that were shared by Ray around students potentially not participating in the 401k, not purchasing a home, kind of putting off some of those life, uh, those next steps in their life journey um, is a direct result of, of really being overwhelmed by student loan debt. Uh, the other piece that I would like to share with you all uh, is the success coaching model of Earn to Learn. So as I mentioned, there's a financial capability prerequisite uh, before you can even participate in the program or enroll in the program. Think of that as the student's initial investment in themselves. Um, and at that point, right, they're establishing that savings account uh, and starting to systematically save. But in addition to that, there's an ongoing personal finance training requirement with this program. I'm a big believer in financial capability training. And I feel that, you know, just because a student attends a budgeting workshop doesn't mean that they're necessarily uh, equipped to be able to manage that budgeting aspect of their financial well-being. Uh, I think it's the context of repeated exposure to these core financial skills and knowledge that ultimately translate into uh, changing behavior over time. And that's really, in my mind, one of the brilliant aspects of match savings and individual development accounts was not only was it meant to uh, develop a consistent savings behavior, but it was also really meant to help break the cycle of multi-generational poverty. Um, additionally, with our success coaching model, we also have a college readiness training component, which you know incorporates aspects of helping students with the FAFSA, et cetera. And we also have a workforce readiness training component. And I know uh, we're going to be able to hear from some of the other panelists today on some of the aspects of this workforce development training piece. Uh, but I will tell you, it is a really, uh, in my mind, critical component of the Earn to Learn program. Um, in that, we are partnering with employers here in Arizona and creating business mentoring opportunities, job shadowing opportunities, informational session opportunities for the students so they can really learn what's out there and start that process of building that critical network uh, that ultimately translates into them successfully securing work when they graduate um, in their respected field. Um, I guess I'll uh, share a couple of um, remarks relative to some of the questions that Ray teed up for the panel. Um, when we launched Earn to Learn, we launched it on a platform working with credit unions and regional banks where we were opening these accounts on behalf of the students as either custodial or custodial-like. And when I had the opportunity to meet Ray uh, and talk to Ray in depth about the program and share with him some of our early successes, he had asked me what would it look like to replicate the model on the 529. I am really excited to share that we just recently strategically partnered with the Arizona State Treasurer, uh, Treasurer Yi, uh, to actually do just that and pilot Earn to Learn on the 529, which is really geared as a college savings account. Uh, so this is going to be the first time uh, that we're piloting on the 529, but what's happened over the past period of years is we've been approached by multiple states, namely 529 administrators, interested in the possibility of re replicating the model on the 529. And I think uh, I'm really excited to see where this goes. And we're working with a target population that not only uh, is debt adverse, but probably is not even familiar uh, with the 529. I remember standing in a room of 200 parents of college age going students and starting my remarks off uh, talking about federal financial aid and Pell Grants. And I asked the audience of 200 how many of them were familiar with Pell Grant aid and literally less than 10 hands went up. Um, and it took my breath away uh, on that stage. And ultimately, my thought is that if they're not familiar with Pell, they very well are not familiar with 529. So I think this is a really innovative opportunity to bridge uh, two tools in the tool chest to support the low to moderate income population in terms of uh, bringing them to the 529 and successfully serving those families. 
Uh, the other piece, and I just mentioned it a little bit, uh, is that multiple states uh, are at the table interested in potentially replicating this model. Uh, and I am really excited to say many of them were actually funded by Assets for Independence. So um, we're really excited to see this growing momentum behind the concept of match savings and the uh, the level of uh, excitement around what I'm about to share, which is uh, this is ultimately um, uh, inspired uh, drafting legislation, uh, working with legislative in the U.S. Senate. Uh, so back in 2019, I had the opportunity to work with legislative counsel in the U.S. Senate to draft the Earn to Learn Act, uh, which is effectively, in the legislative language, a mirror of the model that I just described to you all. Uh, it's going to require a local match, uh, much like Ray shared relative to assets for independence. And the intent is that this program uh, may ultimately be housed with a Department of Education that will then match that local match. Uh, so we're really excited about the possibility of this. And I'm also excited to share with you guys that it looks like this bill could literally be potentially introduced with bipartisan support in the Senate uh, in the coming, in the next couple of weeks. So, um, Anyway, uh, I have a lot to say and I could take up the entire time, but I will pause for air and um, hand this uh, presentation off to Eileen. And um, I just really, really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys about Earn to Learn. Thank you so much, Kate. It is a pleasure to join everyone today and to share a little bit about Arizona's experience with Earn to Learn, share our excitement at the prospect of this becoming potentially a national model, and really share some observations and reflections of what we can learn from the Arizona experience that we can fast forward to the rest of the country. So today I'd like to just share some remarks really to talk a bit about why in Arizona, at the Arizona Board of Regents, the governing body for our public universities, we were excited at the prospect of the model of Earn to Learn, and then really shift into why it's not just an opportunity for an era of innovation and post-secondary funding and finance, but increasingly becoming an imperative. So it's terrific to be with this group today, a group that's been working together for quite a long time, to increase opportunities for students and to build economic opportunity for all, which we know increasingly depends on educational attainment. So in Arizona, we really had the opportunity to meet Kate and understand her vision for Earn to Learn, and it came about right at the, at the appropriate and perfect time. If you think back 10 years ago, that seems so long ago in many ways, but it has really created a lot of underpinnings to the challenges that we're facing as a nation now in terms of higher ed finance. So we were in the wake of the Great Recession. I'm going to continue with the Arizona example, which was one of the most extreme. We were suffering from one of the largest budget deficits in the nation on the order of 40%. And it became very clear that not just budget stabilization and fiscal recovery was important, but really we needed to think about what was going to need, need to be done to help with economic recovery. We also took a look at what students were experiencing and what people were experiencing. If you recall in the Great Recession, you were more likely to keep your job if you had a higher education degree. Certainly a four-year degree meant you were much more likely to keep your job. So we fast forward to this most recent pandemic. We wanna think a little bit uh, differently about what that experience was, particularly the impacts on women. But even in this most recent pandemic, you were probably more likely to be able to work because you could work from home and have more flexibility, but certainly an opportunity and area for research for those of you who are tuning in today. But thinking about the impacts of the Great Recession, not only were states grappling with jobs, the intense focus on jobs and the a real recognition finally at the level at which we needed to get thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of Americans with higher education attainment credentials, that really became the forefront of all of the movement in higher education nationally. So if you think back, states were creating attainment goals for the first time, 
higher education institutions were revising their strategic plans. And while they were enjoying really a surplus of students who were coming through the doors to become better educated or retool perhaps, it, it also really exposed the lack of sustainability that we have for the higher education financing model, in part because of the impacts of the recession, to be sure, that resulted in a lot of budget cuts, but certainly also because of the changing structure of state and federal budgets, which we can talk more about. So the prospect of Earn to Learn was very appealing. It gave us a chance at this moment where, for the first time, Arizona, like many states, was putting student success into the strategic plans of universities. If you think long ago, just the Constitution wanted us to have institutions of higher learning, there really wasn't an expectation for completion or for, or for retaining students from year to year. So with this new focus on student success, Kate's model of in order to learn was very appealing because the model itself required two things. One, for the student to fully participate in their own experience. They were going to be providing skin in the game, as you would say, to help fund their education. They would not be locked out of other resources that could be made available to them, but that savings experience clearly was showing students had the ability and the desire to persist. At the same time, the elements of financial training really helped students understand better what student loans and grants were about and importantly, the program also extended financial literacy training to family members. So thinking holistically about the family and the college experience, particularly at a point in time when more first-gen students than ever were going to college, this was all very exciting. And now that we've had the benefit of close to 10 years, we can see that these students are persisting, that they are more likely to succeed. So something in this combination of the enhanced match where the student puts together some dollars fundamental to their own savings and then gets matched with other grant aid is a very compelling model for us to think about as the federal government continues to update its notion of how it's going to help support financing higher education. This is going to become even more important for a couple of reasons. I talked about the Arizona example. We are seeing tremendous changes demographically here at Arizona. For 10 years, we've had a majority minority K-12 system, so that's not new. But what we're seeing is that more students than ever need to get educated at higher levels than ever before. Some of these groups are really for the first time realizing meaningful access to our higher education system. And at the same time, we have this economic imperative that they will not have access to jobs. Here it's two thirds of the jobs require a post-secondary level. So post-secondary level credential to really even be a, a, a door open to a student. So all these things are coming together at a point in time that makes it more important for us to really examine what's happening in states that are high growth, high rates of demographic change, and who are growing in terms of economy and population. So we hope to share this example of Arizona and Earn to Learn in particular with the rest of the nation. So the notion that we could have a federal bill that will allow this to proliferate further in states is very exciting. The program itself, Earn to Learn, is now manifesting in other states and they have their own touches, but the core concepts of Earn to Learn remain the same and I think are worthy of further examination. So let's just talk for a few minutes about state and federal governments and the, as I said earlier, imperative for them to continue to innovate in financing. Wesley did a terrific job in summarizing for us the landscape in the beginning. And he started with talking about Pell Grants and President Johnson. That was two generations of Americans ago. That I would be the first to argue that that is going to be insufficient for us to continue to expect that we're only going to address higher education finance and policy every 25, 50 years. This needs to be something that moves to the top of the agenda and we can't let it lose its place. What we've seen largely in the wake of the Great Recession, and remember this is our fourth economic shock in 20 years, so we need to, we need to change our game plan. We need to think about what's happening in the federal budget pressures and in state budget pressures. Apart from recovery, we have a huge uptick in 
in spending for health care, that is putting a greater compression on state budgets, including higher education, which has largely been seen as dispensable. So I think Earn to Learn again provides us with a model where we can begin to think about how we incent completion and how we can meaningfully attach federal and state dollars to help support the great ambitions of Pell, but move students along to completion. We know that the institutions themselves are dependent on the dollars that come from Pell. Students are as well, but we're going to have to think about where we go from here if we're going to move greater numbers of people to higher levels of educational attainment. While the notions of debt forgiveness are laudable, those things are, I think, more of something we should be considering for relief. They create very uneven impacts. Ultimately, they encourage, if by just waiving and forgiving debt, we encourage just the addition to the federal debt loads. That's really not, it's not just kicking the can, that's creating a terrific tax burden shift in terms of fi financing higher education. And while that might be great as a temporary relief measure, we really need to begin to think about how holistically we're going to revamp our expectations of the state and federal partnership and how we're going to incent students to greater levels of completion and how we're going to make those models sustainable, particularly in an era where we have greater budget compression. So I will pause here and save some, save some further remarks for when we have Q&A. I want to thank you for paying attention to this and for tuning in today. This to me is one of America's great challenges. It's one of its great opportunities, and I absolutely believe it's one of our most important federal imperatives. So thank you. Well, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on which time zone you, you're uh, in. My name is Lee Lambert, and I'm honored to be the chancellor of the Pima Community College District here in Tucson, Arizona. We're just about an hour north of the Arizona state of Sonora uh, uh, line. Um, so what I'd like to do is talk about why this is important and, and, and then touch on how a little bit of of how it's working at Pima Community College. Uh, but let me start with, with a story, because I think the story eliminates, illuminates why this is so important. So when I was the president of Shoreline Community College in the Seattle, Washington area, and I, I work with employers, uh, especially in the automotive uh, service uh, uh, training uh, area, and, and they would repeatedly express concerns that the students who were going through the technician program uh, were not able to manage their money very well once they completed the program and went into the dealerships. So they were going from, you know, some of them just making minimum wage to all of a sudden making fifty, sixty thousand dollars, and in just a few short years they could be making a hundred thousand dollars a year, and they were blowing their money, and. And because they didn't understand how money works and how to manage their money. So the dealers worked with us to run financial literacy workshops during the lunch period for the students. So when you take that, that story and, and then you couple it with the notion of college affordability, uh, student success, the need to, to develop skills, we, we needed a more holistic, comprehensive solution. I didn't realize that there was one that was already percolating in the state of Arizona until I arrived in the state of Arizona. And within my first year, I had the great pleasure of meeting Kate Hoffman. So Kate uh, uh, came to visit me uh, within my first year here at Pima Community College, and she shared with me this innovative program called Earn to Learn. And, but it was really designed initially for, for a student starting out at the university and going on to get their baccalaureate uh, education. And I said to Kate, well, why can't this be done at the associate degree level? Many of our students will come and do the first two years and then transfer on to university. And many of our students are low income. Many of them first in their family, uh, disadvantaged in terms of going to college. But I also uh, at that time talked to her about why many of our students were also taking our career technical education programs, and they have an intent to go directly into employment, tying back to my shoreline experience. And so could we, at some point uh, in the future, start to incorporate the community college students and those CTE students into an earn to learn model? And I'm so excited and so pleased that 
Pima Community College and Maricopa Community College District, we're the first two community colleges in the country to, to be offering Earn to Learn. And just to put it in perspective from an equity standpoint, uh, because so much of what we do, and, and, and as noted at the outset, you know, I really believe community colleges, especially we're institutions of social justice, we are, we're a place where hope, opportunity uh, come together, and especially for so many people of color, and especially for so many of our female students. So at Pima, 66% of our students participating in Earn to Learn are female. 76% of our students participating in Earn to Learn are people of color. Uh, and specifically, 53% are Latinx. So, so when we think about the future of this country and where things are headed, we have to do more to support our communities of color, more to support our, our, our female students, especially to pursue uh, skill-based programs. So, so when I look at Earn to Learn and some of the key elements that all come together, and this is the key part of it, it actually addresses the college affordability piece. It actually teaches students how to manage money and the whole debt management piece. It also, with the co uh, success coaches, it builds in that student success support piece. And ultimately, it all integrates around, we're going to give you skills. So this isn't just, as Eileen was pointing out, let's just forgive your debt. Well, in forgiving a debt, I'm not necessarily against that as a, as a, as a general concept, but are we making sure that, that people don't return to debt because do they understand how to manage the money? Uh, and, and that's what Earn to Learn does. It actually does that skill building. And I think that's so essential. But then with that coaching piece, you have someone who's there with you all along the way. And I think that's, that's equally as important. So let me talk a little bit about not so much the transfer side. I think uh, uh, many folks understand the transfer side. The first two years, you come to a community college and then you go on to the university. Uh, it's the, the career technical education side. And so we're, we're beginning a pilot that is focused on our aviation technology program. And our aviation technology program, um, you know, there are great jobs in this community. Uh, as, as many of you may be aware, Arizona is one of the leading states for, for aviation um, employment. And, and a key part of that is having the airframe and power plant uh, technician, the person who can service the aircraft, uh, available and unfortunately, you know, uh, there's just so many, there's more vacancies or more opportunities than there are individuals who are prepared to come into that part of the workforce to work on aircraft. And I just want to do a, a shout out to, to Glenn Hammer and I want to shout out to Governor Ducey and the business leaders in this community for supporting the doubling of Pima's aviation program. Uh, and so thanks for their support. The state of Arizona has made an investment in that expansion in the form of a building build out, uh, which will allow us to double our output of aviation technicians for the, for the industry. So if you go through this program in, in about 18 months, you're going to be in a great position to be earning over $50,000 a year. And it's akin to that same problem I mentioned to when I was in Seattle, Washington. And, and so as this goes well, we're hoping to scale it to other high demand, high wage opportunity programs. I think we need to keep in mind that, that for a lot of these students to go through these programs, sometimes just building an on-ramp, providing the resources and the, uh, and the student supports are essential uh, as they move through that. And, and I'll illustrate another one. I know there was a question brought up about supporting uh, short-term Pell. Um, uh, and many of us in the community college uh, world, we believe that that we've got to do a better job of supporting short-term Pell. And I'll use an illustration as an example. Our EMT program, emergency medical technicians, that's a nine-credit program. But what sometimes gets lost, it's it, it's that for many of those individuals who go through that program, they then decide to go on to be doctors. They then decide to go on to be nurses. You get, I think you get what I'm saying, right? Sometimes it's easy to just look at a short-term program and say, well, that, that's not going to lead to X. It actually is a gateway. It's an on-ramp to greater opportunities. So we have to find a way to support the funding for those types of programs to bring more folks in, especially individuals of color. 
And, and so we're doing that in the aviation program. We, we create some shorter term pieces that bring them into the aviation piece and then move them through. We've created shorter term programs in Megatronics. So that way folks can come in and then they wanna go on. And we're finding a lot of these folks wanna go on and get the degree. So we can't think of them in isolation. We need to look at things as a whole piece and then having an earn to learn model that really starts to provide that holistic 360 support mechanism from the funding to the debt management to the uh, career coaching and, and, and more importantly, that skill building. So I, I will stop there and I'm gonna turn it over to Glenn. Well, it's, it's tough to follow Kate, Eileen, and Chancellor Lambert, but I, I, will, do my, I will do my best. Uh, first, I will say uh, thank you for the chance to participate today. Uh, the Earn to Learn program is something that we in Arizona took great pride in, and it's exciting to see that there's uh, going to be federal legislation as as well as this is a, this is an effort that's uh, expanding out uh, to other states and uh, the state of Texas and I've I've been here for about uh, five or six weeks now uh, is 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 a great state for earn to learn to expand in uh, you know the the statistics in in Texas uh, are as as follows. Uh, the average student loan debt in Texas looks to be a little bit higher than in Arizona. It's about uh, thirty-two thousand dollars or so, and the total number is about one hundred eleven billion dollars. So you can see right from there that's 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 a big issue. And for you know, uh, reasons discussed earlier, it does uh, delay things like uh, home ownership and 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 things things like that. What, what, I, what I do believe is the universal applicability of, of Kate's Earn to Learn program is, is the skin in the game and the way the funds are, are leveraged. Uh, you know, in my book, putting in a uh, dollar, getting eight dollars back of value, uh, that's quite a bit. And, you know, the numbers that she used, 2,000 to get 16,000, that equals 18,000, which, uh, which is a significant number. Is, 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 is very, very important. And you know, one of the things that I don't care if you're in Arizona, Texas, or one of the 48 other states, if you talk to the business community, uh, pre-pandemic, uh, the number one issue really became uh, workforce development. So uh, Chancellor Lambert talked about some of his exciting initiatives at Pima Community College. Uh, Workforce development was at at the top of, of our of our agenda, and fortunately, as the vaccines are going in people's arms, uh, workforce is is coming back. As if it's not the top issue, it's it's pretty darn pretty darn close to it. Uh, Arizona has had a great uh, a program to get uh, a, a significant percentage of its population by 2030 uh, with a post high school credential. And I'm proud to report Texas has uh, something similar as, as well. I believe it was a program that, uh, or an initiative led by Governor Abbott, uh, the 60 by 30 Texas program. Uh, the goals support Earn to Learn. I'll, I'll talk about a couple of these. Uh, one, increasing the number of adult learners completing a certificate or degree. And we certainly see Earn to Learn uh, enrollees having uh, a vastly higher completion rates compared to uh, non-participating students. I mean, the numbers that Kate uh, put out there are, are just really incredible. To think 85% for non-traditional enrollees to have that level of completion is, is, is something that uh, we, we need in Arizona, Texas, and all 48 states. Providing students marketable skills and having that coaching component, uh, also very, very important. We all need help. Uh, I know that I needed a lot of help uh, throughout the, the college process, 
and, and, and even uh, well beyond that. And, you know, again, reducing the student loan debt. Uh, the numbers from the, the presentation earlier about the difference between 2008 and today are pretty astonishing. That $1.6 trillion number nationally, that is a, that is a big number. We, we, we have to uh, figure out a way to, in a smart, effective way, uh, reduce, reduce, that, reduce that number. And then, you know, I, I want to just point out a couple of other things. Uh, the pandemic has made it uh, similar, I'd argue, to 2008. We learn in these diff in difficult economic times uh, that advanced degree, uh, that post high school credential becomes all the more important to weather those types of storms. So, uh, you know, 2008 might have been in the background for a lot of people uh, with the pandemic. Uh, we are reminded again how important it is to have uh, some sort of certificate degree post uh, post high school. And again, I want to commend Kate for the continued evolution of the program, which has gone from universities to community colleges uh, to uh, to other types of, of voca vocational training, uh, including including a CTA. Uh, and. You know, I'll close on a couple of points and then we could open it up for Q&A because I, I do think our previous speakers covered most of the ground I, I wanted to talk about. But this to me is just a terrific uh, example of a public-private partnership. Uh, you've got the private sector involved, you've got students, you've got government all leveraging funds for the most noble of purposes, to provide educational experiences that will serve uh, these students, these adults well, and their families well throughout their lives. I actually, I think this has a generational uh, impact. It's that powerful. Uh, so as we all work towards reducing poverty, increasing uh, equality, increasing opportunity, uh, the Earn to Learn program is a very important component of that. And I could say as someone who certainly has a lot of Arizona DNA, and now I'm getting some Texas DNA, uh, we want to see this program successful in Arizona, Texas, and across the country. And again, I, I commend uh, Kate Hoffman for her, uh, for her incredible work. And thank you for the opportunity to be here uh, this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, that was fabulous. Uh, Kate, Eileen, Lee, and Glenn. Um, we're really looking forward to uh, the Q&A. I have a million questions, but I put a couple on the table already. And I understand that uh, the, the chat will be, uh, PJ will be forward, forwarding me questions from the chat. So I'm wondering if we have any uh, to start with. Okay. Well, let me let me while folks are getting organized, uh, let me let me just throw out a, a, a kind of another question that kind of struck me as we were uh, I, as I was listening to the presentations. Um, so um, it, it, this is such a great idea. Um, you know the the financial literacy effects, the completion rates, the reductions on student loans. Um, it, but you're starting with high school kids. What if you were to start the program uh, earlier in life? There's really good research coming out of the asset building child savings account field showing that when kids have these accounts, they, you know, they think differently and more positively about their future. They make behavior changes. So what if, you know, what if we were to, you know, maybe start these in, in junior high or elementary school? Do you think, you know, do you think that, um, you know, we can even have more impact, you know, than we're, than we're having already? Okay. Uh, so that's, that's my question. Uh, think about that, but there is actually there's a few questions have come in on the chat now. So uh, what if this can be for anybody? Um, yeah, turn on your videos, please, when you when you have a question, if, if you would like. But the first question is, are students on the hook for any of the match funds if they end up not completing? OK, panelists, please, Panelist, turn, on please, your please turn on your video. Yeah, please turn on yeah, your video when you're your responding. Video. OK. Got to unmute, Kate. 
sorry about that. Um, so the students are not on the hook uh, for that match component uh, and predicated on uh, them successfully completing the semester, right? That's additional grant aid. And the way that I've often described it is that's money that they didn't have to borrow and they don't have to pay back. Um, now, if the student happens to stop moving forward in the semester before the drop act date, uh, they wouldn't be receiving the match, but they would get their student savings returned to them. So the money that those students save in that account uh, does belong to the student. Uh, obviously, once they're on campus, the combination of the savings plus the match go towards offsetting that unmet need, as I had shared before. And then I just want to say really quickly, relative to uh, enrolling students at an earlier age, uh, as you know, we were blessed to receive the seed money from Assets for Independence, but because of the grant terms that were associated with that funding through the federal government, we really only had the ability to recruit juniors and seniors uh, because otherwise we would have run out of runway with those grant terms. But I have definitely been a big believer that recruiting students at a younger age, especially middle school, when a lot of students are making those critical decisions about the possibility of post-secondary, uh, it could be really powerful to have a program like this starting at an earlier age. Great, thank you. Okay, here's a question. One, one, one listener says, it was implied that Earn to Learn can replace Pell's. How do you solve for families that cannot save the $500 match? Replacing Pell's with Earn to Learn is not a total solution. So, I'll answer this question, but there may be others on the panel that would like to also respond. I have definitely described Earn to Learn over the last 10 years as a supplement to Pell. So Pell is a critical, critical tool in the tool chest to support college affordability and access. And I think with a program like Earn to Learn in combination with other forms of supports for those students, uh, it's a really amazing supplement to a program like Earn to Learn, or excuse me, to the Pell program. Great. Great. Okay, and here's one, uh, one, another question here. Ray, if the program Ray, before we go on. Oh, sure. Before we go oh. on, if I could just, if I could just add on to Kate's point, because Please. we do have some data and the program report is geared toward low income, maybe moderate income students. It could work for all students, let's face it, but the, but we really have had a focus on low income students. And what we've seen so far is that, that about 89% of our students are able to meet their monthly savings goals. So it's not to suggest that we shouldn't start earlier or that there might be families that would have a very hard time with the $500. But I do think we've got some a body of data here to build from and a very good success rate to suggest that setting up these stage savings goals is, is helping students meet the goals for their part. Thank, thank you, Eileen, and it reinforces yeah, my point bet. earlier, reinforces my point earlier that income was not the strongest predictor of who could save and who could not. It was access to a structured savings mechanism that really made all the difference. Uh, good, so here's another question. Um, if the program scales nationally, is the expectation that the matching funds will continue to come primarily from college budgets? So I'll go ahead and take a stab at that question. Uh, as we shared, uh, and I think you actually mentioned this, Ray, uh, in the state of Arizona, we working with the universities here in Arizona and now the community college as well, um, positioned institutional aid as that local match um, here in Arizona to leverage the federal funding through assets for independence. So, Ultimately, when we first launched the program in partnership with the three state universities, they uh, allocated 10.5 million in institutional aid that was then matched by the federal program. And we ultimately had 21 million in seed funding to get this project up and off the ground. Um, I will share that several of the states that are at the table interested in replicating the model are looking at the possibility of using state funded needs based aid as that local match. Uh, there's also an example in Oregon uh, where uh, they had also been a, an AFI funded program 
uh, and they have state tax credits that are being utilized as the local match. Uh, I also um, have had conversations with some of these states about the possibility of the private sector and philanthropy in combination with state funding, uh, providing that local match. So when we drafted the Earn to Learn Act, we provided a lot of flexibility in that section where the language is talking about what's possible in terms of the local match. But in the case of Arizona, uh, the schools came to the table with money that was already earmarked to support low income students coming to those schools. So uh, it was an interesting way to effectively be able to double those dollars with the matching opportunity. Great. Okay, that's great. Let's talk, you know, I was really, um, you know, the, the other speakers, all, you know, Eileen and Lee and Glenn really talked about their enthusiasm for this program and talked about they would love to see it go nationally. Kate, what, what's the real potential here? If the legislation passes, if I'm correct, it really only authorizes a demonstration project that doesn't necessarily go right to scale. So, you know, what, what's sort of the theory of change here that you're operating under, that we need more evidence before we can really reach more people across the country? Is that, is that really your vision, Kate? Um, so ultimately, uh, my vision for this model is that, as Glenn stated, it could be available across the country in every single state, supporting low to moderate income students, not just in terms of affordability and access, but also retaining those students through to completion. And I think that's a really critical piece uh, with this approach. And I also think the financial capability training uh, cannot be underscored enough in terms of how significant that is and important that is. Uh, when we drafted uh, the Earn to Learn Act back in the fall of 2019, right, prior to this uh, pandemic, uh, we had positioned it to be a billion dollar expansion of this concept, which in effect would be 500 million in local match to 500 million in federal match. Um, and I will just say, I, your question is fantastic. I mean, ultimately the, the vision is that this is going to potentially become a new model of financing higher education for the country. And I think the vision in writing that legislation was that that would be the next level, right, above what's happening currently in the country. Kate, if I, if I could jump in here, uh, you've got, Ray, you've got an extraordinary group of, of leaders on this call. That This has been, I'd argue, so I've got two shots of Pfizer in my, in my system well over two weeks clinical trials it works so for me i'm back but by the way so be careful it's like it's 1999 again uh this has been battle tested you have eileen klein who's one of the most well-respected uh public officials in arizona in our state's history uh chancellor lambert is uh a nationally internationally regarded uh chancellor this, is, this has been a tested program. The, the key here is scale. When you see numbers like 85%, 80% for first time, uh, if this isn't a silver bullet, it's the closest thing I've seen to it. So the key is the scale. And while I bragged about Arizona, now I'm gonna brag a little bit about Texas where this is coming. Texas, here's a secret, it's a country. The GDP is 1.9 trillion, will be at 2 trillion very soon, ninth largest country if you just took the GDP. So between the two states with what's going on uh, and with the way the gusher of cash is coming out of the feds, this is proven. So this is a case of scale. We scale more Americans, particularly of lower income, not particularly of lower income, are going to be able to get a post secondary degree, a four-year college, two-year degree, or some sort of certificate, and enjoy the American dream. It's really that simple. This is a question of scale. So, Ray, you know, the Federal Reserve, we've got a, uh, you know, a treasury of the secretary that obviously understands the reserve, understands uh, uh, the government uh, and incredibly well. We've got to figure out a way to get there quickly. There's no time to waste. Thank you, Glenn. That's very powerful. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, I see the potential as well. So when we talk about it, this reaching everybody, a question came into the chat, would Earn to Learn work for undocumented students? So in Arizona, uh, the nature of the funding that provided the local match uh, was that it was supporting low to moderate income students in the state of Arizona who qualified for in-state tuition and qualified for federal financial aid. Uh, I did have conversations with uh, our institutions of higher ed about the possibility of expanding this uh, to support the undocumented students. Um, and there absolutely was a very positive response from all of our institutions of higher ed in terms of how critical it is to support those students. But due to the nature of the local match, it allowed for us to support students who qualified for in-state tuition and qualified for federal financial aid. So I think it's really predicated on the rules around the funding and how those rules are written, uh, if that is indeed a, a future possibility. Thank you. Thank you. So, so I've um, I've worked with 529s, as I mentioned, and uh, throughout the country, seven of them now create these accounts at birth. And what what the lesson here is that you is you have leadership in some states and you don't have leadership in others. You know, you can make 529s a very regressive structure, progressive, through things like accounts at birth and earn to learn. But the real question is. Uh, and th from the chat here is like, well, what if what if states have different political appetites or willingness to really want to take this up and to fund this program? You know, is it really sustainable if you don't have state aid? I mean, is there enough support through corporations and philanthropic efforts if the states themselves aren't willing to do it? I'm certainly happy to take a stab at answering that question and then would certainly uh, like other panelists to weigh in on this because I think it's an excellent question. And I think as we know, uh, there are lots of different uh, approaches to supporting higher education depending on the state you're coming from. Uh, and some have a much greater appetite for supporting innovation and supporting uh, different funding mechanisms for students and families within those states. And so um, the, the, I think ultimately over time, as a program like this continues to grow uh, and is taken to scale and is consistently showing the demonstrated success that we've shared today in this panel presentation, that mo more of those states who are maybe on the sidelines or on the fence might be uh, ready to make those types of investments because ultimately that's the population of their state that's the future workforce of their state and the reality of the situation is this is a workforce development strategy we're not just trying to build a pipeline into post-secondary we're really trying to successfully build that pipeline into the workforce and i imagine that with this model uh consistently proving that this is working it's going to uh bring some of those folks off the fence great Okay, we're going to wrap up here by I'm going to invite each of our panelists to give me 30 seconds of closing reflections or comments, and I would like to start with Lee. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Ray. Uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, I think we have to keep everything in a, in a broader context. This is just one piece of an overall strategy that hopefully will be tied to the nation's reskilling recovery effort. And we also have to not lose sight. We either pay on the front end or we're gonna pay on the back end. Over 56% of four-year college graduates uh, drop out of, of college within uh, six years. So can we afford that price tag? Thank you, great. Eileen, would you like to go next? Thanks, thanks for this opportunity today. And as we've talked about, this is an exciting innovation opportunity. And importantly, it's time, it's time for us to get very serious about innovating at both the federal and the state level. We're going to have to figure out how we're gonna make up for not being able to take advantage perhaps of as many international students or other things that have helped us defray costs. Our short-term opportunity is to figure out how to maximize institutional aid so that we can scale this program, see what we can learn from it, and hopefully drive additional innovations that are going to allow states to reach their attainment goals and individuals to really to reach their full potential and economic opportunity thank you thank you
Thank you. Glenn, you're up. This is about maximizing the potential of all Americans. And, and when you think about the international situation and the competition, anytime you see 80, 85% completion rates, this is a federal responsibility. And in my opinion, to, to, to get engaged, we will get states engaged, but the numbers are so astonishingly, astonishingly good that uh, we, we need we need the support on the federal level. So when I see Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis behind me, uh, I'm grateful to be <laughs> participating here today. Thank you. I love your optimism. I really appreciate that, uh, Glenn. And Kate, uh, final word before we turn it back over to PJ. I just guess I will reiterate that, you know, my background was from the financial services sector. When I learned about match savings and individual development accounts and the fact that it brought to the table financial capability training and that it encouraged uh, not only for individuals to invest in themselves with the potential of the match, but also that it had the potential to break the cycle of multi-generational poverty. I mean, I just feel like this is a really incredible time to bring the asset building world together with higher ed in such a way that it could be really transformative for this country and really transformative for so many students and families who are struggling to figure out how they're going to afford to go. And, and you asked this earlier, you know, I think that's probably the number one reason. Not only are they not moving forward potentially with a post-secondary opportunity, but they're not completing uh, they're already there and they're not completing. And so I think a program like this is a really wonderful additional tool in the tool chest to support uh, students on that journey of post-secondary success. Thank you, Kate. Congratulations, you, Kate. Congratulations on your success. Your success. Uh, keep breaking those silos. And I was also and thrilled to hear from Eileen and Lee and Glenn and, and turn it back and over to PJ and thank him again for his leadership on this issue.